unfortunately, you put me right after lunch, too, which is never a good thing for economics, but um, it seems like to, you always bring the economist in last anyway to, to uh, uh, count the dead and tag the wounded and, and declare victory, so. Uh, well, you're off to a great start time. <laughs> So are you counted or tagged? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think is what we've kind of learned as we've been uh, hearing some of the discussion the last couple days. You know, even when we struggle a little bit on the scientific side to kind of quantify things, it, it makes it even more challenging to quantify it on the economic side. But um, everybody's been talking about books, 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 read this book. Have you read this one, Ray? Um, my yeah. Yes, I have it. That figures. <laughs> <laughs> I have it, but you've already talked about a lot of books to get, and I'm always a sucker. I buy a lot of books, but I'm just not a good dedicated reader. Um, but this, you know, when you look back in history, um, there's a lot of civilizations that have come and gone, and a lot of it is related to soil erosion and how they treated their soils. Um, all the discussion of how much we've depleted of our organic matter in our soils, um, you know, about half of the native organic matters disappeared in the last 200 years due to, due to tillage, so it's, it's important, it's coming up on us, and hopefully we can convince producers to start doing something to improve that. Um, a lot now, we've lost our $7 corn, we've lost the $14, $15 beans, um, conditions are changing a little bit. It, it's going to be a struggle as we talk to producers, um, given the current market conditions. Later in the presentation, I'll kind of go through a partial budget, looking at converting from a conventional tillage to a no tillage. Um, the margins are still there. It's still profitable to include the cover crops too, I think in most cases. Uh, but again, that's going to be site specific. Producer to producer, it's going to vary. Well, we really need to get them think more long term than, than the short term. And understandably, they think year to year because they're trying to cash flow. And that's just the challenge that we have as we work with producers is showing them the long term benefits and showing the profitability of that. Um, this is a study that's been done on the Marsden farm. Uh, through ISU, the transition period was 03 to 05. We talked about one of the pillars being uh, diversification of the rotation. And they looked at a corn soybean rotation compared to a corn bean oat. Uh, I think they had red clover in that one and a four year rotation of corn bean, oat, alfalfa, and alfalfa the following year too. Um, when you look at the yields, you know, that corn years and the soybean years, the, the longer term rotation, at least comparable, if not better. Um, and as far as return to land and management, you know, very comparable. But farm programs, crop insurance, everything else, there's a lot of pressure to kind of stay with that corn bean rotation. It's what they're used to. Uh, nobody necessarily wants to go back to livestock. So I understand we've got challenges to do that, but the data's out there to justify a diversified um, rotation. It's no different than when we start talking about the soil health and bringing back that stability. It's the same thing when you start talking about a, a production agriculture and having a stable, economic, viable operation. I mean, you think back 20, 30, 40 years ago, they were diversified. Well, through this research, what did they discover? Um, basically, the diverse rotation, as I showed on the earlier slide, corn was about 4% better on average. Soybeans, about 9% better on average. Um, the diverse rotation also required less, uh, or was more, less vulnerable to changing of input costs because you're relying less on the herbicides, you're relying less on the synthetic fertilizers. Yep. The two years corn bean. Corn. The three year was a corn bean oat. I think it, they used clover. Okay. And then it was a corn bean oat, alfalfa with that as a nurse crop. And then another year of alfalfa for the four year. 
Uh, in addition to that, you know, herbicides on average is about 88% less on those three year, four year rotation compared to the four year. Um, I think we've, uh, and there's a lot of anecdotal comments you'll hear from folks like Dave Brandt and other producers of how much they've reduced their herbicide. Same when you start talking about, you know, nitrogen or any fertilizer. They showed in that three year and four year rotation of 80 to 86 percent reduction of synthetic fertilizers. Guys that are doing the cover crops, and I'll get to that too, because we're not going to get everybody to go corn, bean, oat, meadow, meadow. Uh, it's definitely challenging if they're not going to go to livestock. But we've talked about it, you know, the last couple days. We can mimic that by going to the uh, uh, cover <coughs> crops. Uh, additionally, you start talking about diseases. In 2010, they had some sudden death syndrome in the soybeans. The uh, conventional system, and they had GMOs and non-GMOs in their plots too. But of the non-GMO, 97% were affected, 27% of the GMO. But the rotational systems, the three year and the four year, less than 9% were affected. Regardless of GMO or non-GMO? Uh, on the rotational, I think that was the case. I can't remember for sure if they had both GMO and non-GMO in the, in the rotational one. So again, we started talking about, well, we, we're going to probably get some producers that may go to livestock. Maybe you got some younger guys coming in to uh, the farm and they're interested in going, going into livestock. So there's opportunities out there. For those that aren't interested in, in a longer term rotation, um, we can look at the cover crop to try to mimic that longer rotation, getting more diversification in. We can build organic matter. We can scavenge the end, um, you know, do some compaction, uh, take care of compaction issues, erosion control, um, suppression of weeds. Again, we talk about recycling nutrients and improving water quality. Um, so now let's try and put some value on some of this and I'm going to kind of just hit certain aspects at least initially before I kind of work through a, a partial budget of converting from a conventional to a no-till. So one, way, one value we have of the soil organic matter is what's the nutrient value. Um, my assumption here is you know, the first top six inches of, of the soil you got about two million pounds. Uh, and for every 1% of organic matter, that's going to be 20,000 pounds. You're going to have 1,000 pounds of nitrogen, 100 of phosphorus, 100 of potassium, 100 of sulfur, and about 10,000 pounds or 5 ton of carbon. Um, those are current prices from the 2014 Iowa State Enterprise budgets and it totals up about $584 for every 1% of organic matter per acre. Now, uh, I don't know if some of the conversion was talked about, but you, on a conservative basis, I think you could say in 10 years, you could increase organic matter 1%. And I think that's probably not being real <laughs> aggressive in how, you know, how, what cover crops are you using. Um, I know Doug back there made the comment of having more residue and building it up quicker. And, and we have cases, we have producers that have done that. So I think on a conservative basis then, on that 584, if you're averaging say a tenth or 0.15% uh, per year of increasing that organic matter, then you're looking at about $58 per year value to $88 per year. Um, this is some information that I got from uh, Steve Berger, and he was mentioned earlier. I just kind of want to demonstrate it. it. This is just some additional challenges of as we work with producers. I mean, this is a guy that's doing no-till, doing the cover crops. He puts on uh, swine manure and, and <coughs> poultry manure. Um, he's got some pretty good trend here in 04. His overall average on this field was 3.3%. Four years, it didn't really change much on average. But if you look at the grids, You'll see some jump up, some will go down. Um, here's one that was 3%, went down to 2.6. And then in 2012, the average did jump up to 4%. 
there's just enough variability in things that are going on. You got variability even in the sampling process. So, you know, I, I didn't really talk to him specifically if he had some ideas as to why some of those numbers were doing what they were doing. And some of his ground has been long-term no-till. Some of these farms, he didn't maybe have them very long. So a lot of the things as we're working with producers, you, it's, you just can't pinpoint the exact change because you don't know what's their baseline of their farm or what they're starting with. And that variability is gonna, gonna create challenges. Um, this example, he went from 3.2 and 04 on up to 3.9. Similar overall change, but when you start looking at individual cells, I mean, there's 4%, but still went down a half a percent. And is this just with no-till, or was there a He's no-till, cover crops, uh, swine manure, and poultry manure. And, you know, I don't have exact, you know, what this farm did and didn't yeah. do on, on specifics. And he hasn't been using cover crops that long, has he? 90s, but, but it's gonna vary. I got three farms here, so it varies from which farm, you know, was he doing what on? Uh, I think he typically just used cereal rye. Yeah. So, you know, again, you're not looking at a multi-species type situation here. So I think he's kind of seeing that improvement of the 10th to 1.5% maybe. But here's one where, what, about six year period, it was 3.1, did go up, but then went back down three years later. So it's just kind of wanted to put this up here to just kind of demonstrate there's going to be that variability. Um, probably the uh, other folks to have more of the technical background than myself and well, shoot, that could be just a need to talk about that. Right. And that's what I was talking to Tom Casper earlier about that. And that's kind of what he was saying too. So it's just in, Maybe I'm not showing something that you guys don't already know. I don't know, but I thought it's just, it's important um, to just kind of bear that in mind. Even when we try to start putting dollars uh, or qualitative changes to some of these things to try and put some economics to it, that drives you crazy trying to put some numbers to it. Um, so we've got, and we've talked about, um, uh, Jerry Hatfield kind of covered the, the water holding capacity issue. Um, you know, we've got, uh, oops, sorry. Um, so for about a pound of soil organic matter can absorb 18 to 20 pounds of water. Um, I think uh, Ray was saying what, 17,000 to 25,000. Yeah. You're gonna hear a lot of different numbers and it just, it just depends on context of what you're talking about. But this is uh, results from the SAIR CTIC survey done in 2013 on the 2012. You may have seen this. Uh, if not, it's kind of got some good information. You know, it's not research data, it's interview data. Um, probably a little more along the lines of anecdotal, but I think it's good information. Um, but the blue is without the co uh, with covers and what's the yield without covers. Uh, corn was about 11.1. Um, bushels better with cover than without. Um, I think I put that on uh, in 2012. The average for the year was about 6.94, almost seven dollars uh, per bushel for corn that year. So you're talking about 77 buck value in in that yield differential with having the covers on there. So would that have paid for the cover crops? Um, and this is you know several Midwestern states. It's yeah, that was Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, maybe some of Dakotas, Minnesota. I'm not sure all the states that were involved. But the uh, soybeans also had about a five bushel, six bushel differential. Uh, the average price for 2012 was about $14.50. So pretty much in that $70 range again, $71. Um, so for that year where we had some stress, we had uh, moisture in the spring, shut off, had that stress period like Jerry was talking about. Um, definitely made a difference in the yield. Uh, just another example of this, the yield effects. 
related to cover crops. Um, this is a demonstration in Illinois. Um, trying to think of all the background. I don't know how long it's been in no-till. Uh, I'm sure it's, well, we got some down here at least with the cover crop was a six year period. Rye grass for one year. With the conventional, and this was in 2005, rainfall between May and September was 2.3 inches. Conventional yield is 82, the no cover, but it's like it has been no-till for, again, I don't know the exact number of years, but it was 124 bushel. Uh, so what do you got there, 42 bushel? Heck of a difference there. One year rye, rye grass, still another 12, 13 bushel. Um, differential, whether you got clay pan or no clay pan. But those cover crops made a heck of a difference on the yield. And what do we set up for this year? Has anybody looked at the drought monitor lately? This was, I pulled it off March 25th. We've got about, that's more than three quarters of the state, either abnormally dry or some pockets of severe drought too. Um, you know, how much we get going into planting time, who knows. Uh, but we're not, not sitting real well. We've got some additional cover crops that have gone out there. Hopefully, uh, and I, I guess that's, it, it, it's great, but it's, to me it's also a concern that we're reaching those producers that have tried cover crops for the first time and we're working with them to manage them properly so they get them killed at the right time so that it doesn't have an effect on the yield so that they are successful because that's going to be real important. Um, this was a Michigan study that I found. Uh, I can't remember the time period that that was in, but what they had come up with was for every 1% of organic matter, there's about a 12% increase in crop yields. And theirs was looking at mostly corn and soybeans too. But if we use kind of an example or typical in Iowa of 180 bushel corn, 50 bushel soybeans, if we start out at a 3% organic matter, and we want to increase that to, by 1%, um, 50 bushel, 12% increase is about 6 bushel. And $11 is about anywhere from 11 to 11.50 is kind of where we're at for fall uh, 2014 prices right now. So that would be about 66 bucks per acre. If we're looking at it, kind of that conservative one-tenth to 0.15% increase per year, you're looking at about a 6.60 to $10 per acre per year um, increase in value just related to the yield. So, or corn, again, the 12%, 22 bushel, about $99 per acre. Uh, it'd be an annual basis at that, you know, 10th percent every year, about $10 to almost $15. Now, what I'd like to do is just kind of work through a hypothetical um, scenario where you've got a guy that's been doing conventional tillage. Um, and I'll get into the individual uh, inputs. But and my information is coming directly from the uh, production budgets, enterprise budgets from Iowa State. And on a 180 bushel uh, budget, I used the 443 and 1124, which I pulled that out, uh, one of the elevators for uh, October 14 delivery. And it was March 7th when I pulled that off. So we're looking about net return for corn. Um, you know, the operating ownership costs, it's from the ISU budgets of somewhere around $25 to $26 per acre. Uh, soybeans at 50 bushel, uh, 1124 delivery in the fall right now, get a 562. Net return margin's a lot tighter, we're around five bucks on soybeans. And this is at the conventional rate. So what we can do now is we want to look at only what would change. Um, partial budget is the best way to do that. And all we're doing is looking at what changes are we going to make from conventional tillage to a no-till. This is data off the 2014 custom rate survey. Um, and of some typical tillages. I just pulled out chisel plows. 
chisel disc, tandem disc, vertical tillage, subsoil, ranging anywhere from 14 bucks an acre to 20 bucks an acre. Um, the conventional planter runs about 18. No-till planter, no-till drill, it's about 19 bucks an acre. To seed, establish, terminate cover crop, you know probably better as well as I do. Yeah, that can be all over the place depending on what you're going to use for a mix. But I was just looking at cereal rye, uh, flying it on, and a uh, Roundup. So somewhere around 44 bucks an acre. So carry that baseline net return of almost $31 for a two-year rotation corn and beans. These are some of the input changes that would occur over that two-year period. We're going to have some additional inputs. Year one, year two of doing cereal rye. I won't run down every number so we can kind of get out of here at a decent time, but you've got the additional aerial application, herbicide, and then if you, you're going to have to have a no-till plant or no-till drill. That's an increase from what the producer's expenses would have been excuse me, of a dollar per acre, or for that two year period, two dollars per acre. So the total increase is almost $90, $91, um, just for the cover crop and change of equipment. Now, what are we going to get rid of? Well, in this situation, I assumed in the uh, uh, soybean stubble going into corn, they were disking and field cultivating before, that's a $28 reduction. Uh, I assumed about a half of reduction of what herbicides were being used in a conventional system. That saved about $13. The nitrogen value from that cover crop, um, I pegged at 8.8. .8. I've got some numbers behind this. I'm not going to go through each calculation, but uh, as this PowerPoint's provided, I can add some of that into the notes so you'll be able to know what my calculations were all based on. But as far as the, you know, the uh, tillage cost, that's all from that custom rate survey. So chisel disc, fill, cultivate, uh, the corn residues, $44 reduction. Herbicide reduction, um, we're going to try and get by with just uh, one, one burn down of that cover crop. So I think we can get rid of one, one uh, roundup uh, from the conventional system. So basically a total uh, reduction of inputs of about $109. Now, what other benefits would we have out there from reducing the tillage, putting on a cover crop, and it's a pretty immediate impact? I'm sure nobody in here has seen any of this, right? <laughs> um, but switching to no-till, Doing the cover crops is going to be an immediate impact of stopping a significant, if not all, of this. Uh, again, we probably can't armor for every bad weather rainfall, but we're going to see an effect. So what I did to value that was what's the, and this is just the nutrient loss. There's other damages, um, like benefits south. related to it. Yeah, like droughts, like he was talking about, Jerry. See, one of the right. Yeah, we, yeah, right. I'm not. Me. I'm not even factoring that in, and and that that gets harder to predict because I'm just looking at an immediate impact. This is the short term. The, the drought resilience, that benefit, that's more of a long term benefit. Well, yeah, it depends. Yeah, it depends when how long you're in the system. If you've right. been in the system for four, four, three, four, five years consistently, the no-till will beat the conventional. And yields by not a little, by, by significantly. Okay. More. Okay. So it's got to be good to put into that equation too. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, what I was just trying to capture was that short-term effect. Uh, well, this is probably not a bad time to mention that. Um, there's a spreadsheet. It's kind of in the quote-unquote beta version. Um, that a couple other state economists, the one from Missouri and Illinois, have developed. A, it was trying to hone in mostly on cover crop. Uh, I think it could be expanded right now. It won't address a rotation uh, system, but it's looking at the cost of cover crop. It's also trying to quantify, um, you know, increasing that water holding capacity and trying to put a number on that and come up with kind of an average annual value for that. So it's, uh, again, it's just kind of in the beta stage, but hopefully we'll have something usable here pretty soon. So as far as 
you know, reducing that sheet erosion, erosion, reducing that ephemeral gully erosion. I made some estimates on, you know, width and depth and how much was uh, eroded away. I should say Barb helped me come up with some numbers on that part. <laughs> I put the nutrients to it anyway. But basically on an on a average basis, it would be about $7. Again, that's making some assumptions on um, how much was being eroded over an 80 acre field. Um, but that's something we can quantify um, and put a number to. So in this instance, I'm looking at about a $14 benefit by having cover crop going to the no-till to reduce erosion damages. Um, so grand total, you're looking at still <clears throat> having a net cash flow of $63. Um, I had done something like this similar and I was trying to be extra conservative, but then I thought, eh, shouldn't have to be that conservative. I, for the custom rates, I used the low end. If you've looked at the custom rate survey, you know they got the low and the high, and I was using the low number initially, and this came out somewhere around $35, I think, 30 something. Um, I changed it and went with the average. And so, I mean, when you're working with a producer, it needs to be their number. Um, you know, you can grab custom rate surveys. Um, the uh, Bill Lazarus out of University of Minnesota has an excellent database on new equipment, accounts for all the costs as far as operating and, and ownership. Um, you could look at those numbers, but ultimately as you're working with a producer, you know, use what number they feel is reasonable as far as changing of the inputs like that. Uh, let's see. Other benefits that I didn't even try to talk about, Doug had brought up, did an excellent job talking about grazing. You know, you're going to graze these cover crops, there's benefits to that. Um, maybe you want to make money just doing seed production, the producer might be. So there's other opportunities, other benefits. Um, I think the one, one thing I didn't quite work into my presentation, but Doug had made the comment on the grazing I hadn't thought about before about are you, um, you know, feeding the livestock below the soil as well as what's on top. Uh, something I heard somebody else talk about too. When it comes to the cover crops, producers need to be managing their cover crops just like their cash crops. And I think that's what it's going to come down to to have success with these cover crops. And that's what's going to help us have success with soil health too. Another one would be nutrient retention. So yeah. not leaching. All right. Yeah. So I mean, and that would be immediate. Yes. That's it. Did I get done soon enough? Any other, any questions? <clears throat> 